and welcome to the AAJA newscast here in Washington, D.C. My name is Jane Kim. And I'm Amy Cho, broadcasting from the local Fox affiliate WTTG. Many mom and pop shops in Chinatown are being pushed out by commercialized businesses. Here's Diane Tao on how one business is managing to stay afloat. The Chinese Friendship Arc greets you to a rather small Chinatown. At almost every corner is a familiar corporation with Chinese characters. At H and 7 stands one of the last family-owned Chinese shops in Chinatown. This retail store has continued to meet consumer expectations. I can't get out because <laughs> I'm um, just lots of things that I see that complement things I have at home that we have actually bought in Asia. So we're, I mean, this is a great shop. She is not the only one raving about the place. The unapologetic website Yelp gives it a rating of almost five stars. You can find anything from Bruce Lee, China dolls, and herbs. If you're ever looking for jade, they've got plenty. Richard Chang's parents opened the business 30 years ago. It really isn't another shop like this around this area until you go Virginia, Maryland or something, and it's like, what, 20 minutes, half hour away? Will this hidden gem be around for another 30 years? I can't predict tomorrow, but, you know, we try our best for, we're basically for the pe here for the people. Yeah. Chinatown isn't what it was 30 years ago. Let's break it down for you. Reports from the D.C. Mayor's office shows in 1970 there were 3,000 Native Chinese. Now has decreased to 300. According to this walking tour map, in 1975, there were almost 30 Chinese businesses. Now it's down to 16. Chinatown may be commercializing, but this mom and pop shop is here to stay. In Washington, D.C., I'm Diane Tao. A temporary bill is in place in Washington, D.C. that allows doctors to prescribe medical marijuana to an expanded list of conditions. Business has been booming. Some patients no longer have to wait to visit the Tacoma Wellness Center. It's a good, good place in our community. This woman didn't want to show her face because she buys drugs here, medical marijuana. And while we weren't allowed to see the medical marijuana locked behind doors, more customers are coming by to pick it up. A few months ago, this medical marijuana store had just 75 registered customers. Now, that number has skyrocketed to more than 500. My phones are really ringing off the hook. Store owner Jeffrey Kahn is dispensing more marijuana to a wider base of customers. A few weeks ago, D.C. Mayor Vincent Gray added to the list of prescription-eligible conditions. More doctors are participating, and, and as a result, more patients are participating. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it was something that, that took a little while to catch on, but, uh, but now certainly has. Washingtonians like this loyal customer are grateful Tacoma Wellness Center is around the corner. The people here are great. They're good people to talk to. Providing different options to those who are suffering and may need a different kind of medication. This November, D.C. residents will vote on the legalization of marijuana for recreational use. From House of Cards to Homeland, there is no shortage of TV shows set in Washington, but many of them aren't filmed here. Leo Zhou has the story. The capital is missing out and losing big on Hollywood resources. Democracy is so overrated. In recent years, the district's neighboring states racked in hundreds of millions of dollars from film and television productions. They could have been hauled into Washington. D.C. is a unique um, environment for filming. It's unlike any other city or state in America. Since 2010, according to D.C.'s Office of Motion Picture and Television Development, D.C. hasn't paid out a cent in film subsidies, while Maryland has tripled its incentives program to $22 million. Taxi? No. It's not like the city has not seen film activity here. The 2010 movie How Do You Know received a $2 million incentive from the city, but ended up spending only $1.5 million while filming in town. We have no lighting houses. We have very few, if any, film post-production houses. So even if a company came here to spend that money, it would really go to outside companies and outside individuals. Bagley says attracting productions to the city is a rather complicated issue that no money can easily solve. Without easy solution, it seems House of Cards is not coming to DC soon. In the meanwhile, many say if the district does want to give away some money, they better give it to local filmmakers because they're creating jobs and spending a lot of money right here in D.C. Liu Zhou, 
AHAA Voices. Watergate? I'm not even sure. I've never heard of that. It's a uh, place named the Watergate. Some sort of dam. Someone trying to hide some sort of evidence, I think. Governor Chris Christie's Bridgegate. Oh, maybe this Bridgegate was just payback. And even South Park's Closet Gate with Tom Cruise. Mr. Cruise, come out of the closet. Attach gate to anything, and instantly you've got a scandal on your hands. If you know it's a scandal, something bad has happened if it has that gate attached to it. 40 years ago, D.C. saw a real-life scandal, ripe with a break-in, a government cover-up, and the ouster of an infamous president. Neely Tucker, a reporter with the Washington Post. It really changed how, how the political game is played. Whatever politicians say is fair game, any aspect of their lives is open and fair. Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein blew open the biggest political scandal to date. Their investigation of the Nixon administration's attempted cover-up of a break-in at the Democratic Party's headquarters was reimagined in the 1976 political thriller All the President's Men. Just follow the money. What happened here at Watergate in 1972 changed the face of D.C. forever. It became a city where the powerful and the famous often booze and schmooze with each other. From Vice President Joe Biden on uh, NBC's that, Parks and Recreation. How, how did you do this? To Senator John McCain on Fox's 24. These days, you can't flip the channel without seeing the nation's capital right in your living room. But the city isn't just the backdrop for Hollywood hits. It's the new reality, where politicians are now celebrities. D.C., the evolving playground for the powerful, and a whole river of gated scandals, all from one night at Watergate. Melissa Yang, AAJA Voices. Americans are seeing more South Asians in the media, but are they playing themselves? Ariana Prasad asks a panelist to describe the trends he's been seeing. South Asians are more prominent in media than ever, and Americans are watching closely. More and more people are interested in hearing diverse stories from underrepresented communities. The exposure helps Americans get a better feel for what South Asians are truly like. Arabic sounding names or names that would be from South Asia. We are more comfortable with those things, I think, than we had been before. Though they are represented, South Asians are still shadowed by stereotypes. Whether it's the terrorist character, the cab driver, the bodega owner, or whatever, there are these tropes that we still traffic in, unfortunately. And you know, Hindus are different from Muslims, so you can't just loop us onto one, and sometimes TV shows do that. Stories about South Asians are still more prevalent than having South Asians deliver stories as journalists. You, know, you treat South Asians just like you would any other uh, journalist of color. The more local uh, and on camera it is, I think that you are seeing a move to have these diverse communities be represented by the people who are actually delivering them their news. Those who are in media strive to change the South Asian image. So I covered Ramadan, I covered Diwali, and these are things that people really don't know that much about in the area, so I make an effort to kind of shed some light and educate at the same time. The more people are seeing the ability to not only play themselves and characters in their communities, but given the opportunity to play things that aren't, say, specific to their skin color or ethnicity. South Asians who are blazing the media trail make room for brown talent to follow suit. South Asian children growing up in the States to have not even a role model, but just to see, you know, people of our culture represented in media, you know, as closely as it is to reality. They get to see, hey, look, somebody else is doing this. This isn't, this isn't theory. You know, I can convince my parents to send me to that school to get the training I need to go do this, and it's not a pipe dream. The panel Moore spoke at was the only conference panel that was open to the public. AAJA members came together on Wednesday night to open up the convention. Brian Newen took a look at why convention goers came and what they were looking forward to. So, I'm Paul Chan, the national president of AAJA, and again, I want to echo our co-chair for a fantastic job the DC chapter has done. I try and come to the convention every other year, or every year or so, or maybe two times every three years. And uh, at this point in my career, I've been a journalist for 25 years, so uh, it's, it's become more of a social thing at this point than uh, trying to advance professionally or go to the job fair and land the job. So, um, but it's you know coming back and seeing old friends and trying to make new friends. Although it, it's uh, 
the very uh, alarming thing about getting to be at my point in uh, the point in my career is that there's an influx of younger journalists, and uh, there are fewer and fewer people I know at the convention every year. I'm Bobby Lee. I'm a media entrepreneur. I run a personal finance video blog called Two Minute Finance. I'm looking forward to networking. I'm looking forward uh, to learning more about the latest innovations, the latest practices, uh, the best practices in the, in the journalism industry. The different chapters have been like different families. Like I got really close with the San Francisco chapter up in uh, Berkeley, and they were really like mentors and supporters. And it was the same in LA, where people really want to help you. There are so many interesting stories that people have left the industry and come back, or or who have uh, tried to get their start. I'd love to hear people's stories. And that's what, uh, that's the best part of the conference. The Asian American Journal Association Conference is here in the capital. Aspiring young journalists are here to network with some of the best. Diane Tao has the scoop. Welcome to Washington, D.C. The Asian American Journalists Association Convention opened its door this weekend in the nation's capital. Both professionals and students made their way to the registration booth to gain access to the exclusive workshops. Students from across the country came with the same objectives. First of all, continuing to reconnect with individuals that have built a connection with through AHA. I hope to just gain um, a lot of new networking connections, new experiences. My goal is to get a job here, network as much as I can, and then get that job. When asked about which workshop they plan to attend. Um, there is like one about interactive journalism. Roughly 50 students have registered for the convention. The news bug fever may have them proactive, but what is really important is what speakers have to say on how to make a good impression. So you want to appear very polished, but I also feel like for students, there's always that little spark, that willingness to learn. I think that needs to admit too, um, but overall just having a really good attitude, uh, the eagerness to learn, I think that's really important. San Diego reporter Liberty Zabala leaves us with tips on how to better our journalistic skills. Really study every day. Study your craft every day. Read books. Follow people that you admire. In Washington, D.C., I'm Diane Tao. There are many success stories in the journalism industry. What's the secret? Neuron Altair has the story. Stepping into the world of journalism takes a lot more than a solid resume. To succeed, you need a pound of ambition and you need to pound the pavement. Like investigative reporter Yvette Cabrera, she's been laid off twice but has no intention of leaving the business. I knew that I, for sure that I was going to strive to get back into, um, into to daily journalism because I see the difference that it makes out there. It's what I've been doing. This is my 20th year in the business, and I can't imagine myself doing anything else. I got ridiculously lucky. Kai Rizdal walks and talks journalism for a living. You know, if you're ambitious now, I don't think there's any reason to, to believe that this is a bad time to be in journalism. The Marketplace host got into the industry at 34 years old when he messaged a radio news editor for a chance 15 years ago. And he says the hustle is still worth it. So ambition and a little luck may be just the nudge these job seekers need. Neuron Altair, AAJA Voices. For broadcast journalists, that all-important reel can make or break a career. Ariana Prasad shares what recruiters are and aren't looking for when they look at your tape. Demo reels allow journalists to show off their skills before stepping in front of the lens. I've asked a few journalists here about what applicants can do to reel them in. The reporter stand-up isn't hard. But standing out can be. You know, you get your array of stand-ups in the beginning, then you get your hard news story, and then your feature story. Are you passionate about what you do? Are you passionate about telling stories? We can figure that out in about seven seconds. When compiling material, put yourself in different situations as a storyteller. A range of storytelling techniques. Uh, how do you handle a fun story? How do you handle a tragic story? Uh, how do you handle breaking news? While showing your skills, be sure to tailor your tape to each station. Different stations have different brands. Some stations are a hard news, breaking news station, and if you send them a bunch of fun, silly stuff, they're not going to want you. Broadcast isn't completely visual. Recruiters are looking for good writing as well. My hair is cloth, my makeup's on right, um, and I look good. Yeah, you've got to look good. But you've also got to write well so you could sound good. As journalism moves online, 
so does the presentation of one's work. People get a YouTube channel, um, brand it with your name and have it attached to your website and put your reel and put some of your work on the YouTube channel. And no matter who's watching, recruiters stress the importance of speaking to your audience. Understanding who your audience is, if you don't understand who your audience is when you're sending a resume tape, you're not going to understand who your audience is when you become a reporter for my shop. That you can put local news in a national context because they're looking for the big picture story in a way and you have to be able to relate it in a simple way. Rest assured, it's still possible to have your recruiter hooked. People have been watching TV news now for 50 years and they've seen it all. So if there's any way you can ever prove to me that you don't have the same old tired story, I'm going to watch and I want to, and that's going to make you stand out above all the others. Like the rest of your web presence, your demo reel should be kept up to date online. Networking at a convention can seem like a daunting task. Several journalists and recruiters share their tips on how to make the most out of the convention. With hundreds of attendees and recruiters all in one room, how can you make your resume stand out and make a lasting impression? Well, they want to be well dressed, they want to look like a professional, they want to be organized, they want to have their material with them. That material might be in the form of a hard copy resume. Just to be authentic, just to be you. Um, you don't want to be the kind of person that's going to come up and give sort of the stereotypical, hey, how you doing, you know, and flash that fake smile. Um, be yourself, you know, and uh, be honest and tell a little bit about yourself. I think a lot of times uh, we get a little too uh, caught up in the formalities of things. I think you can be successful at the convention by being professional and being poised and showing that you really are ready for the real world. If you're super nervous, I would say take a breath and just remember that you're never going to get an answer to a question without asking it. Um, no one's going to come to you. You need to go to them and you'll realize that everyone here has been in your position at one point before, and so no one's going to look down on you or talk to you badly or not want to help you. That's what these things are for. In conclusion, the recruiters are here to help you, and though networking can appear daunting, it can only further your career. Jacqueline Lee, AJA Voices. These days, it's not enough for journalists just to file a story and be done. They need to be active on social media, too. Twilon Nugent found out just how important Twitter is in the journalism world, and in one case, how it can even impact the story itself. I think Twitter comes in handy when you're trying to find the people that are affected by the news or people who care about the news. 140 characters or less. That's how news is shared by reporters and made by citizens these days. And we want to make sure that you know we're we're being able to communicate news and things like that uh, to our to our constituents and our, our our audience base. Nelson Mendoza works for One Community, a group that supports LGBT individuals and businesses. One Community played a huge part in urging Arizona Governor Jan Brewer to veto controversial legislation this spring. After weighing all of the arguments, I have vetoed Senate Bill 1062. Senate Bill 1062 would have allowed business owners to refuse service to anyone based on their own religious beliefs. One community reacted strongly to the bill and started a social media campaign. We had mobilized, created a Facebook. From that Facebook, we utilized the hashtag, I believe it was bad for AZ biz. So anytime that SB 1062 was referenced, it was B2 1062 hashtag stop 1062 hashtag bad for AZ biz. And that was circulated again on Twitter, on Facebook. Support to veto the Arizona bill was cultivated through social media, and the nation took notice. Arizona Senate Bill 1062. Firing up a national debate. What is 1062? And journalists across the nation are finding that sites like Twitter have become essential and all-consuming in today's tech-centric journalism world. I live tweet um, press conferences, court trials, hearings. Today's modern breed of journalists relies heavily on social media. If they don't have an online presence, they run the risk of missing out on stories, sources, and sharing with the entire online community. All of us are expected to use social media. It's just a part of what we do. Finding news, making news, and sharing news has been changed forever by just a few clicks on a keyboard. We law Nugent, AAJA Voices. Journalists at the AAJA convention have been tweeting about it all week long. You can see those tweets with the hashtag AAJA14. Two sisters have set up a chocolate shop here in D.C., but it will satisfy more than just your sweet tooth. Take a look. The moment you enter chocolate chocolate, 
you may see only treats. Chocolate peanut butter cup, please. Sure. But you might be surprised to find out what is sweet. Many years ago, when I was a little schoolgirl in Korea, is not necessarily edible. Okay. Ginger Park and her sister Frances started their independent chocolate shop 31 years ago in the D.C. area. The store sells treats from all around the world. Chocolates from Zurich, chocolates from Baltimore, chocolates from Brussels, chocolates from Vermont. And they also make their own chocolates. We do make five different kinds of truffles. I actually make them on a daily basis. But what customers may not know is that the two are also children's book authors. The soldiers drew a big line that divided Korea into two. The two write stories inspired by the experiences of Koreans and Korean Americans. This book is based off of their mother's story and her journey from North to South Korea. And that was the first thing I remember asking her. I said, Mom, why is it we don't know your family? And why is it you always talked about having to run away from home? And she told us the entire story. Ginger says writing and sharing chocolate go hand in hand. It, it's kind of um, a dichotomous life, I guess, because as a writer, you need to spend a lot of time alone. And as a chocolate shop owner, you're out, you put yourself out there. So it gives us that balance and harmony. From chocolate making to book writing, the Park Sisters have made a very sweet difference. That piece of chocolate was delectable. I could definitely go for some of that right now. Staying on the topic of food, when most people think of Washington, D.C., they usually think of the White House, the monuments, and Capitol Hill. Twilan Nugent found something that's just as essential to D.C., but most visitors don't even know about it. It's something that we have only in D.C. that people will only know if they were from this area. Or knew Shannon Shepard is talking about something called mumbo sauce. What is it exactly? It's like a combination sauce, okay? A little bit sweet, a little bit sour, a little bit spicy. <laughs> The unique sauce first popped up at African-American owned wing joints and was then adopted by Chinese carryouts. As for the exact origin, it's a hotly debated topic. Almost as hot as the chicken wing served up at a classic Petworth neighborhood eatery known for its mumbo sauce. This restaurant been here about 47 years. Smokey's is just one of the many places serving up the tangy sauce. The love DC natives have for the condiment is everlasting. Every time I came home, I would come home and get chick fried chicken with mumbo sauce and fries like as soon as I get off the plane. Smokey's owner Angie Lee isn't quite sure why her sauce is so popular, but she knows how much her customers love it. They like a Smokey's mumbo sauce. They always say best. Smokey's chicken wings are so popular, they estimate they go through about 80 pounds of chicken wings a day and three gallons of mumbo sauce. Patrons at Smokey's use the sauce liberally, and they always give it a thumbs up. The basic components are constant, barbecue sauce, sugar, vinegar, and a few other additions, of which Angie vinegar likes to here, keep to herself. I mix with some other seasoning, you know. Mumbo sauce may not be as well known as the White House, but like the White House, it calls D.C. home too. Twilaw Nugent, AAJA Voices. Now I want some of that mumbo sauce. With ebooks and bookstore giants like Barnes & Noble, how do independent bookstores stay open? Jacqueline Lee takes us inside Writer's Books. As one of the few female-owned specialty bookstores, Writer's Books is the oldest independent bookstore in all of Washington, D.C. While it's downsized to a small storefront, it's still thriving. Our tagline is for the inquisitive. Writer's focuses on professional and educational publications. While many read using the latest technology, longtime customers like Nadim Elahi still enjoy spending time being surrounded by books. I like writers' book, books because of its uh, collection. They have an uh, economics and a history collection that I find to be quite good, uh, specialized, and uh, books that you typically don't find in, um, in regular mainstream bookstores you find, you find here. Writers first opened its doors in 1936. Store manager Daphne Gaskins has kept this place up and running for the last 20 years. She's been challenged by changes in technology. Within my time period here, I saw the 
increase of the internet, communications, Wi-Fi, and with that also came in all the different books so people would learn about it until now that everybody, instead of buying it in a book, they're buying it on an e-book. Despite the surge of e-books and digital libraries, there's a sense of magic when walking into an actual bookstore. I think that's what always brings people in because you never know what you can discover, what you might be interested in. Daphne wants to uphold the spirit of learning about new things in person rather than on a screen and keep these shelves stocked for the long haul. Jacqueline Lee, AAJA Voices. In a conference of Asian Americans, there's one question that's bound to come up. What kind of Asian are you? Twilon Nugent joins us in the studio. Twilon, tell us about your take on how you answer that question. Well, Amy, my name is Twilon, and people ask me how to pronounce my name all the time. And after they ask me my name, they usually ask me the question, where are you from? My answer, Wisconsin, the land of beer, cheese, and the greatest football team on the planet. I was born there, I was raised there, and it's the place that I'm always going to call home. I'm a true Wisconsinite at heart, but I also get another question after that. They always ask, no, where are you really from? I tell them my parents are Vietnamese because my parents are from Vietnam, but I'm not. Some people are bothered by the question, and for others, people don't mind it. There's no right or wrong way to really approach it because people take such different stances on it. The biggest issue is that it's a simple question and it carries so much weight. It juggles race, nationality, gender, and those can all be different. As for the question of what kind of Asian are you, I'm the kind of Asian that's just as American as you are. Jane, Amy? We now leave you with a look inside a popular DC establishment. For more coverage, be sure to check out our website at voices.aaja.org. I'm Amy Cho. And I'm Jane Kim. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next year in San Francisco. Yeah, splash, splash. Our voices molded and accented thunder, probably because for so long history only shamed us into silence. Oh. My name is Pages Matam. Bus was a Buzz is amazing. It's a, it's a community, you know, it's a place where, you know, we can gather, and it's a safe space where people can gather and express themselves however they feel like. I got it, I got it. Rented dress shoes, what have you seen? How many toes have grown cold inside of you? How many men have stepped down from the altar as you, as their God? Uh, just a date night, uh, basically. I haven't been to Bus Boys in a while, so I thought it'd be a good idea. It's a nice scene, so just wanted to come out and uh, see the talent. All weddings, parties, and gatherings involving any sort of music last for at least three days. Probably because everybody showed up late. What? <laughs> Bus Boys and Poets is kind of really important to us. It kind of stands for all things racial and diverse and cultural and politics, everything.